In the Florida Panhandle, a young passerby discovers a killer's dumping ground. A metal chain may be a link to a victim's final hours. But investigators must first confirm the identity from the charred bones if they ever hope to solve the brutal crime. Daddy! An idyllic backyard in rural Tennessee becomes the backdrop for the unthinkable. Jackie! A little girl disappears in broad daylight. With every passing hour, police lose hope of ever seeing her alive. This one? But before detectives can prove murder, they must find her body. Some killers choose to hide their victims. And investigators must then rely on forensic examiners to uncover proof of murder. These are just two extraordinary crimes that have made their way into the medical examiner's casebook. episode, some of the names have been changed. The Gulf Coast of the Florida Panhandle is known for its quiet beaches and peaceful living. But on March 4, 1999, Okaloosa County's tranquil lifestyle was threatened. That afternoon, investigator Stan Griggs of the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office was called to an isolated wooded area children discovered a body while playing in the woods. Panicked, a young mother phoned police. In his 15 years with the department, Griggs had never seen anything like it. There was a charred body that was secured to a tree with chains and rope. We actually could not tell definitively if it was male or female. The investigators scoured the scene for clues, looking for anything that would tell them who this person was and why he or she died so violently. Although the crime scene was littered with debris, physical clues were scarce. There wasn't a lot of evidence around the body. Uh, a few cans, uh, a roll of duct tape, a couple items of clothing. We didn't find anything that would lead toward the identification of, of the victim, much less any perpetrators. The victim's hands were bound with a blood-stained cord, and duct tape was stretched across what remained of the skull. Fragmented bones and tattered clothing were charred beyond recognition. It appeared the victim had been dead for quite some time. There was insect activity, an insect activity that indicated that whoever perpetrated this made more than one visit. The body showed evidence of maggots, a process that normally takes two weeks. But the finding posed more questions than it answered. The insects were burned just like the body. Forensic specialist Jan Johnson took samples. It was a puzzle. We couldn't figure out why someone would come back, obviously, a couple of weeks after the person had died to burn the body. Dr. Michael Birkland, chief deputy medical examiner for the district, carefully prepared to recover the remains. We were uh, very intent on uh, getting the body removed exactly the way it was pretty much positioned at the scene uh, because of the, uh, an injury that I identified to the neck region that was going to be very important to keep the neck in that, in that position until we got back and were able to x-ray. The remains were taken to the morgue for autopsy. Evidence collected at the scene was transferred to the Forensic Science Unit at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. None of the items found at the crime scene produced anything concrete. 
Authorities were no closer to identifying the victim or the killer. After examination, it was determined the victim was an adult male, less than six feet tall. Establishing cause of death would fall to Dr. Michael Berkland. When we got the body back, we went ahead and did x-rays looking for any projectiles or foreign bodies, and we uh, did not see any evidence uh, that this represented either a, a, a gunshot wound case or there were no foreign knife tips or anything like that uh, left in the body. The x-rays showed a number of uh, fractures uh, to the body uh, of uh, the uh, upper extremities, uh, what we call defense injuries, where the arms had been put up uh, to try to ward off blows. Uh, there were a number of skull fractures uh, that uh, caused uh, extensive fracturing of the base of the skull. Dr. Brooklyn believed the victim was killed by a blunt force trauma to the neck. The autopsy report documented a brutal murder, and it also helped establish a sequence of events. If you're transporting a dead body to a what we would consider a secondary dump site, there, there's no need to bind it, gag it, and chain it to a tree. Uh, so it was common sense that told us that the body was probably transported there initially live, uh, may have already indeed been injured because uh, this was a fairly stocky person. And so uh, without subduing him somehow, uh, I would have thought would have put up a, a considerable fight. Uh, and certainly you would not have to chain a dead person to the tree. But Dr. Brooklyn was still puzzled by the insects. There were several populations of maggots present in the body. He concluded from their numbers and their size that the victim had been dead about a month. The most startling revelation was that there was charred maggots indicating that uh, the maggots had been there for a while, grown up a little bit, and then somebody came back and set the fire. For uh, the investigation, that meant that whoever had brought the body there had came back to the scene again. Fingerprinting the victim was difficult. His hands had been damaged by fire. But there was enough soft tissue on the right thumb to make an impression. Given that uh, one of his fingers was not badly involved in the charring process, we were able to, to, uh, to find enough minutia uh, and ridge detail. So we were able to uh, uh, have sufficient uh, information from that one finger to attempt a match. While the prints were sent for comparison to the Florida Crime Lab, investigator Griggs was determined to learn the identity of the victim. The autopsy established the victim died sometime around the 1st of February. Investigator Griggs began checking missing persons reports. We send out a bulletin over to law enforcement net that we have found the body and asking for any kind of missing persons information other agencies may have. One stood out as a strong possibility. A local restaurant worker was reported missing on February 13, 1999. Cordell Richards was a 32-year-old male of Asian descent. The last time anyone saw him was around the 3rd. We checked with the Fort Walton Beach Police Department, and they told us a friend had reported Cordell Richards missing. They naturally went to the apartment to check on his welfare. There they found young people who claimed that they didn't know where he was. A young student named Crystal Maestas rented a room from Cordell. 17-year-old Ron Bell was her boyfriend. The two teenagers confirmed Cordell left in early February, but they didn't know why. Okay. Is there anybody else in the house? Just us two now. Mind if I take a look? Good. Sir, sir could you have a seat over there? Ron Bell and Crystal Maestas stuck with a story that Cordell Richards just disappeared after receiving some unknown type of court papers. He piled up some black bags in the apartment and the next day he was gone along with the black bags. They never saw him again. What's your first name? Crystal. 
Just to do me a favor. The teenager's story seems suspicious. Give me a call. Let me know. Sure. Okay, here's my car. All my information is on the car. Detective Griggs decided to interview the friend that reported Cordell Richards missing. Just have a seat right there. I understand that you're the one that reported Cordell Richards missing. Yes, correct. Okay, you're a friend of his? Yeah, uh, we've known each other for about a year and a half. Okay. According to his friend, Cordell Richards was a good man. Some golf later, huh? He was especially close to his grandparents, spending a lot of time nice with them home. since his grandfather had fallen ill. Cordell was divorced with two small children. Thank you so much. He worked at two jobs in order to support his family. Everybody I talked to about Cordell Richards told me what a responsible person he was a uh, hard-working person. He worked several jobs, and his bosses always considered him highly reliable. Investigators finally believed they were about to put a name on the victim that had remained anonymous for all these weeks. The name was Cordell Richards. In Okaloosa County, Florida, investigators struggled to identify a body that was not much more than a skeleton. The victim was badly burned and chained to a tree. After checking missing persons reports, the sheriff's department uncovered a possible match. Forensic specialist Jan Johnson worked to identify the body using a single thumbprint. This body was extremely decomposed and burned, and I was very shocked to find that there was still enough friction-rich detail to affect an identification. The fingerprints did match the fingerprints of the unidentified deceased, which was the skeletal remains of Cordell Richards. Investigator Griggs. Uh, this fingerprints is confirmed it. Cordell Richards was no longer a missing person. He was a murder victim. That is correct. Investigators returned to the Fort Walton Beach apartment complex where Cordell Richards had lived. How you doing? Hi. Stan Griggs with the Sheriff's Office. Can we speak to you for a minute? Sure. Can we come on in? Yeah. Crystal Maestas answered the door. What's going on? I need to ask you a few questions about Cordell Richards. Yeah, I ran a room for him. You do? Which room? The one right there. Forensic specialist Jan Johnson analyzed the apartment. Okay, we have a search warrant for this apartment, okay? Because we're trying to locate Mr. Richards, okay? Here, why don't you look it over? Okay, just... If you want to step outside, outside. yes, ma'am. It was sparse, but there were some items left behind that to me, the average person wouldn't leave behind. I knew Cordell Richards exclusively rode a bicycle. He didn't drive. A bicycle was there. It was a small but important clue. Griggs wondered if Cordell was taken from his apartment by force. A visual examination uh, did not detect uh, any blood evidence, so we decided to use luminol. Luminol is a presumptive test which is used on trace amounts of blood or blood that's been cleaned up. We sprayed the apartment and there were eight areas that did give a positive reaction for blood. We've got a medium velocity spatter pattern here it looks like 
also a couple of transfer stains on what looks like partial hand impressions. After I documented the blood spatter, I then swabbed those areas and those swabbings were sent to our laboratory for DNA analysis and the blood came back as being conclusive as that of Cordell Richards. Back in the lab, Johnson tested her theory of how the spatter got onto the wall. Using blood-soaked sponges and paper targets, she reproduced medium velocity spatter Medium velocity spatter is one millimeter to three millimeters in diameter and normally is associated with forceful impacts from blood force trauma. Okay, thank you. They now had proof Cordell Richards was brutally beaten in his apartment. Hey guys. But in order to find his killer, they needed to find out why. Have you heard of any robberies, home invasions, or burglaries. Detectives in checked for reported break-ins in the area. I have anything like that. There weren't any. In fact, in recent years, there were very few robberies in the neighborhood. I didn't know why Cordell Richards was killed. We were looking at possible uh, uh, gambling debts. Uh, possible uh, debts like uh, he may have owed. Uh, that was a possibility. Uh, it didn't seem like he was broken in. It was a, a haphazard thing. Yeah. Investigators canvassed the neighborhood near where the body was found. Do you remember anything? One woman recalled seeing an unfamiliar car parked near the woods about a month before. Right. And I noticed two teenagers coming from those woods over there. Okay. And. It was a gray hatchback. It had a missing window. Like a compact car. And one of the um, rear windows was punched out and was broken because there was a black trash bag covering it. Okay. The next day, investigators found Ronald Bell and Crystal Maestas as they were about to enter a gray car matching the witness's description. Is this your vehicle? Yes, sir. It is. This? Yes. Bell confirmed the car belonged to him. You know Cordell Richards? Um, yes, I met him a few times and I've come to pick her up. Okay. You know Cordell Richards, ma'am? Yeah, I rent a room from him. Okay. What happened to your window on the vehicle? Um, I had a burglary a couple of weeks ago. Evidence was mounting. Both teenagers knew Cordell Richards. Bell's car was spotted near the crime scene. And the victim's blood was found on the walls of the apartment Crystal shared with him. I no? don't know where it's at. It was enough to obtain a warrant to search the car. The car was searched and dusted for fingerprints. But no evidence was found connecting the vehicle to the victim. Next, investigators questioned officials at the school Ron Bell attended that you already saw in there? I did know that he was gone from the 2nd to the 5th straight, and then uh, quite a few He was absent days several days in early February. It's an unusual pattern for Is him. It? Come on in. Ted Mazzo, a fellow student, confirmed Ronald Bell borrowed his truck twice during that time. So you don't mind me answering any questions or anything I have today? Uh, no, sir. But Mazzo was not the only person to have information on Bell. So, what can you tell me about Cordell Richards? He told us that Ron Bell asked him to decipher the password on a computer. He described the computer to me. He also described the layout of the interior of Cordell Richards' apartment. How hard can it be? Ron and Crystal were trying to log onto the internet but they couldn't get past the password. They asked Paul Martin to hack in. Can't you get a ride home or something? Try something else. Yeah, you gotta help us with some bags. Just keep working on that. 
Paul noticed that all the files on the computer belonged to someone named Cordell. He also said that Ron Bell disposed of some property from the apartment and some dumpsters. We searched dumpsters up and down the area, didn't find anything. Of course, by this time it had been a couple months. We just had hopes that maybe something may have fallen out to the side. Uh, we did uh, have some fortune where Cordell Richards identification card was found near a dumpster by some telephone workers. Although there was a wealth of circumstantial evidence, it wasn't enough. Hey, Stan. Yeah, can you hang on a second? Okay, thank you. I gotta leave. Without a witness to tie it all together, they couldn't make a case. Anybody that won't talk to anybody but us. Okay, be right there. Hey, can I call you right back? Okay, thank you. On March 17th, Investigator Griggs received a startling message. Someone wanted to talk about the murder anonymously. Thirty-two-year-old Cordell Richards had been brutally murdered. His body was so badly burned, the medical examiner had trouble establishing the cause of death. Thank you. Just as it seemed the case would go cold, investigator Stan Griggs of the Okaloosa Sheriff's Department received a call. The caller was young and terrified. He said he had information about the case. But he only agreed to talk to investigators anonymously. The informant claimed Renee Lynx, a friend of Crystal's, was bragging about the murder. He told us that Renee Lynx told him that she, Ron Bell, and Crystal Maestas were going to kill a guy because the guy had made advances on Crystal. She and Crystal were going to seduce him. Ron Bell would hit him over the head, knock him out, and they would dispose of his body. It was a chilling story. Renee Lynx was called into the sheriff's department for questioning. In exchange for a reduced sentence, Renee Lynx admitted she helped Ronald Bell and Crystal Maestas abduct Cordell Richards and chain him to a tree in the woods. Despite beating and burning him, Cordell Richards was still alive. They purchased a meat cleaver at a discount store to finish him off. Right, if you could, just go ahead and stand up, place your hands behind your back, because you're going to be arrested for murder. Renee Lynx was only 15 years old when she was arrested for murder. Crystal Maestas and her boyfriend, Ronald Bell, were also arrested. Their fate hung on whether or not Investigator Griggs could prove they purchased a meat cleaver at a discount store, as Renee Lynx had alleged. This store has better than average surveillance cameras. We've got video of Ron Bell, Crystal Maestas, and Renee Lynx not only buying the cleaver, but returning it for a refund. Exactly what I need. I'm gonna have to take that from yeah. you. When you see their faces on the video, this was not a, a, a bad happenstance that got out of hand. They're laughing on the video. Is that the original tape? Yes, it is. Okay. Is there any possible way you can trace the new owner of the meat cleaver? Uh, I have to check the bar. They had records of where three cleavers had been returned. One was purchased by a credit card. They checked the inventory numbers and confirmed that that was the cleaver that was 
in question, the one that was used. Yeah, that one right there. That one. Investigators retrieved the meat cleaver as evidence. Just get it out of here. You sure you haven't used it? In the lab, Jan Johnson analyzed the blade for blood. Ultimately, no blood stains were found. They would have to rely on circumstantial evidence and witness testimony to convict the three teenagers who purchased the cleaver. Crystal Maestas gave a very condensed version of the murder of Cordell Richards. Crystal didn't always get along with her landlord. Place of Are you guys deaf or something? I can't even hear myself think in there. But she also knew Cordell was attracted to her. This made her boyfriend, Ronald Bell, very angry. He decided to do something about it. He knocked Cordell unconscious with a blunt object. He was rolled up in a blanket, taken to a place in the western part of our county. He revived. They secured him to a tree. They began beating him with a baseball bat. They take turns hitting him on various parts of his body. He's still moaning. He's un unconscious, but he's, he's moaning. And he's starting to revive again. And it's then Ron Bell pulls out some cigarette lighter fluid, soaks Cordell Richards with it, and lights him on fire. And they come back the next day. Cordell Richards is still alive. He's moaning for help. They go to a nearby department store buy a meat cleaver, go out there, and they finish him off. I think the whole community was horrified that essentially children this age committed such a crime. Crystal Maestas was tried and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Ronald Bell is also serving a life sentence for his role in the murder. They were both tried as adults. Florida investigators combined science and determination to convict killers who were barely old enough to drive. But in Tennessee, when a child is the victim, a whole community comes together to track down a human predator. Montgomery County, Tennessee is located just 40 miles outside of Nashville. It's a place where life is simple and people feel safe. But on the afternoon of July 8, 1996, Jeannie Meyer learned the meaning of fear. Jackie! She was running late. Her son had a dental appointment, and her daughter Jackie was in the backyard picking blackberries. Jackie! Jackie! Jeannie's annoyance quickly turned to panic. Her daughter was only nine years old, and now she was missing. Can you describe her to me? She's nine years old. Okay. She had a, a, um, a pink shirt on, and she had her favorite little The Montgomery County Sheriff's Department responded. Jackie Beard was four foot seven, oh, okay? with sandy yeah, blonde yeah, hair and sure. blue eyes. Okay. She was wearing a pink shirt and jeans. Jeannie tried to think of anything unusual yeah, that yeah. happened yeah. lately. I some other ones, but that's, that's really she recalled seeing a stranger in the neighborhood. Hey, good kick. He was talking to Jackie and her friends. Hey, little girl. When you 
playing around here, if you just look on the ground and you see something, All right, you know, six over there. about six keys Excuse on a ring. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, ma'am. The man identified himself as Tommy Robertson, an undercover police officer. And I lost my keys out here. He said he'd lost his keys somewhere in the neighborhood. He wondered if the children had seen them. If they had seen them around anywhere. So your name is what again? Yeah, it's Tommy, ma'am. Tommy Robertson. And I, I appreciate it. If y'all see my keys around here, we're just call the police department. Okay. We'll All right. That. Thank mm -hmm. you, ma'am. I appreciate have a good day. it. Okay. Um, there are favorite shoes. There are absolutely. The Montgomery favorite. County police officer reassured Jeannie. More often than not, missing children come home. In the meantime, they would do everything they could to find little Jackie. After a quick search of personnel records, investigator Billy Batson discovered there was no Tommy Robertson on the force. The optimism police felt now turned to concern, and every available officer was called in to find the missing girl. In Montgomery County, Tennessee, nine-year-old Jackie Beard was picking blackberries in her backyard. Jackie! Ten minutes Jackie? later, she disappeared. Jackie! Along with police, Montgomery County Rescue Squad coordinated the massive search effort, dispatching the canine unit and community volunteers. They combed the woods, searching for any sign of the missing girl. Billy Batson, an investigator with the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department, tried to remain optimistic. It's a missing child at this point. We uh, have, have initiated uh, ground searches, including dogs and, and people uh, who have volunteered to, to search the area looking for Jackie. Certainly our hopes were high that we would find her uh, and that she would be, she would be safe and, and close to home. Using the Myers house as their starting point, investigators fanned out. They searched the woods for hours. And with each passing hour, it seemed more likely that Jackie had been abducted. Children from the neighborhood were called into the sheriff's department and asked about the man posing as a police officer. Can you look at these here and tell me which one looked close to you? They gave descriptions of the stranger who called himself Tommy Robertson. Um, um, that one will work. This one? Let's capture that. Feature by feature, a composite photo slowly emerged. In Jackie's neighborhood, the ground search intensified. There was no sign of the child or of the man police now suspected of abducting her. Police went door to door, hoping someone would provide them with any information regarding the little girl's whereabouts. Hi, yes. How you doing? I'm Detective Shock. This is Officer Whitaker. But nothing turned up. Investigators hoped media attention would bring them closer to finding Jackie and the stranger who police believed had taken her from her own backyard. The next day, after this information had been in the newspaper, we started receiving uh, several phone calls about an individual named Glenn Rogers who matched the description that was given in the paper and that uh, these people were concerned that, that he at least needed to be checked out. Investigator Batson ran a background check. William Glenn Rogers had a long list of felony convictions. Police were dispatched to bring Rogers in for questioning. Okay. 
Rogers claimed that although he was in the Myers neighborhood the day Jackie disappeared, he never saw her. He was only looking for his keys. Yes. Police didn't believe him, and the results Did of a polygraph that? examination confirmed their suspicions. No. It indicated he was lying. I've been at work a long time. Then he came up with a much different story. He said when he couldn't find his keys, he returned to his car. As he put the car in reverse, he felt a bump as if he hit a tree. Instead, he said he accidentally ran over a little girl, killing her instantly. Rogers panicked. He knew his record would make the accident seem suspicious. So he didn't know what to do. He got in the car, drove. He came to uh, a bridge which goes over the Cumberland River, not far from uh, that scene, and he got out of the car, went to the passenger side, got Jackie from the car, and threw her over the side of the bridge into the Cumberland River. Batson, along with Special Agent Brett Murray of the FBI, were more than a little skeptical. The interview right after the polygraph test, I did not believe. I, I, I did believe the fact that he was responsible for her disappearance, which he basically said he was, but the facts surrounding how she disappeared uh, were not something that we believed. We knew there was more to the story. Uh, the key then was to try to find Jackie. Rogers was placed under arrest while investigators checked out his story. The Montgomery County Rescue Squad and surrounding county squads were dispatched to the Cumberland River. They searched for much needed physical evidence if they hoped to disprove Rogers' story that Jackie's death was an accident. Glenn Rogers has uh, confessed that he was responsible for Jackie Beard's death and he said in his statement that he took her body and threw it off the, uh, the bridge, the zinc plant road that crosses Cumberland River. And at this time, we've initiated dragging operations. Uh, if in fact that's true, we hope to uh, recover her body. Despite an exhaustive search, investigators came away empty-handed. There was no sign of Jackie. Police headed back to their only hope, the one person who knew where to find her. That man was Glenn Rogers, and this time they were determined to get to the truth. In Tennessee, a nine-year-old girl had been missing for three days. William Glenn Rogers, a convicted felon, claimed he accidentally hit Jackie Beard with his car. He said he panicked, then dumped her body in a river. A search team dragged the Cumberland River, but there was no sign of Jackie Beard's body. Investigators suspected Rogers was lying. They called his wife in for questioning. Hi, Mrs. Rogers. Hello. She admitted that on the night of July 8th, her husband left the house for several hours. That's correct. He was about three hours late, actually. His wife remembered the incident because she was angry. He was so late. Rogers came home late that night. Bill, do you know how late it is? Where have you been? She noticed he had mud on his pants and a spot of blood on his shirt. The car was muddy, too. 
Rogers made a vague excuse. He said he'd been walking through the woods. She was waiting for the car to take her grandkids to a school function, so she remembered that. She also indicated that it, at some point she noticed some small smeared fingerprints on the uh, passenger side of his car on the uh, windshield. Detective Batson was determined to find out how those tiny fingerprints got there and whether they proved Jackie Beard was still alive when Rogers put her in the car. For that, he needed a closer look at the suspect's car. A forensic team searched every inch of the vehicle. For an older car, it was suspiciously clean. Rogers had done a thorough job of detailing his car. So thorough, there wasn't a shred of evidence that Jackie Beard had ever been inside it. If there's anything that you want to Frustrated, Batson questioned that. Rogers about the discrepancies between his statement and his wife's. Well, now, you know, um, I've been thinking about this thing. Now, there is something I forgot about. Um, Rogers quickly changed his story to match hers. Without physical evidence or even a body, the sheriff's department couldn't prove him wrong. Four months to the day on November 8th, police in nearby Stewart County received a crucial call. A deer hunter reported seeing human skeletal remains at the land between the lake's wildlife and recreation area. 245 Brother, 10 four. The call was relayed to investigator Batson. Uh, give me a description. The agent in charge down there had heard about this case and uh, he called me and described to me the clothing that they had found down there and uh, I knew at that point that it was possibly Jackie. Investigators and canine units converged on the National Park along with agents of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. The combined team launched an intensive search to recover the remains. Investigators found a skull. Several strands of sandy blonde hair were still attached. Not far away, they discovered a clump of similar hair. Children's clothing was recovered and bagged as evidence. Dr. Murray Marks led a team of anthropologists from the University of Tennessee in a controlled search and recovery effort. A crime scene, a forensic scene, is like an archaeological site. There's only one chance to excavate it. The crime scene was in a rural area, heavily wooded, though all the leaves were, were down. Many times that makes the recovery a little bit more difficult. We found elements scattered in a pr pretty wide area. And then we systematically go through looking at, for one thing, uh, different layers of leaves. Uh, we can tell the seasonality. If the bones are on top of the leaves, obviously, uh, that's happened after they fell. If they're under the leaf or under two or three layers of leaves, we know how many seasons have gone by. The skeletal remains were under one or two layers of leaves, so we knew some time had passed. To learn more, Dr. Marx needed to analyze the skeletal remains. He returned to the Forensic Anthropology Lab at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. We knew that we had a sub-adult individual. Prior to 20 years of age, you can look at dental development and the way the long bones grow and how, how long they are. So you can make an assessment of age relatively easy Sex is difficult to ascertain prior to puberty. 
Yeah. Prior to puberty, we cannot make an assessment of sex in skeletal remains. So we had no idea we were dealing with a female or a male. The length of the long bones revealed that the victim was young, between the ages of seven and nine. 271. We're going to be interested. Dr. In Marks determined the remains were consistent as with as the little girls. Pre-20 years, we're going to look at dental development. The child had died three to nine months ago, well within the time Jackie Beard disappeared. We didn't see cut marks that are indicative of sharp force trauma. We didn't see bludgeoning or blunt force trauma, no fracture to bone. Uh, we didn't find the fragile bones in the neck that would tell us about strangulation. There was no evidence on the bone that told us anything about uh, a cause or manner of death. Now, investigators could only hope to make a positive identification. We also did mitochondrial DNA, comparing the DNA of Jackie with her mother, and that was a match. Identifying the remains was an important step. But Batson was missing the physical evidence needed to link William Glenn Rogers to the death of Jackie Beard. Once again, science provided answers. When her clothing was collected, it was sent to uh, the uh, Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Crime Lab for further analysis. When they examined the clothing, they found some, some fibers uh, on uh, Jackie's clothing that they really couldn't identify. Fibers of this type were also found in Glenn Rogers' car. But they didn't match the car's carpet fibers. Forensic investigators went back to Rogers' house and collected fibers from his carpet. The carpet fibers matched those on Jackie's clothing. Rogers had tracked the fibers into his car. The match conclusively placed Jackie inside the suspect's car. Did you find your keys? Hey, little girl. Yeah, Montgomery County investigators theorized that on July 8, 1996, Glenn Rogers lured nine-year-old Jackie into his car by posing as a trusted figure, a police officer. He then drove to a secluded spot where he raped and killed her. He later hid her body in a secluded area in Land Between the Lakes National Recreation Area. In January of 2000, William Glenn Rogers was convicted of the abduction, rape, and murder of Jackie Beard. At his sentencing hearing, Jackie's mother spoke of her loss. Jackie looked up to me more than anyone else, and I couldn't do the most important thing I would ever do in my life. I couldn't save her from a horrible situation. I cannot bring myself to imagine what she must have had to go through. My beautiful baby, scared, taken by force, molested, and then killed by a man she thought was a safe person. William Glenn Rogers was sentenced to death. To cover their tracks, some killers go to great lengths to hide their vicious acts of violence. But in the end, most efforts fail. Forensic science can uncover the smallest clue. Because even the most determined killer cannot commit the perfect crime.